Hello, everybody. We are back uh, for another interview. So today I have an awesome uh, graduate student at the University of Washington, and she also is a researcher at the Hutch Cancer Lab. Did I get that right, Laura? Uh, it's the, the formal name is the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, but we all just call it the Hutch. All of us, the who, Hutch. Goes, who, all of us who work at the Hutch call it the Hutch. Yeah. Okay. Okay, the Hutch. So, <laughs> so Laura, uh, as a graduate student, has to do a lot of research as well, and so she's going to talk about some of that research. But uh, let's all give it up for Laura Belmont. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zimmerman, for having me today. Uh, my name is Laura Belmont. I am a graduate student over at the University of Washington and Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. Um, I particularly my degree is in molecular and cellular biology, which is sort of a broader term uh, for a lot of different areas. Some people in my program study evolution, some people in my program study viruses or the immune system, how I do, some people study cancer, some people study the brain or even development. Uh, so it, it's a really, really broad term that basically just means anything that sort of can be broken down on a, a smaller scale. Um, so thinking about like what goes on at a cellular level and even within a cell. So what sort of like proteins are at play here? Uh, what genes are, you know, doing? Uh, so it's, it's a really, really broad uh, program. Um, and as a graduate student, we're responsible for both like taking classes at the beginning of the program, serving as a teacher's assistant. So I'll get to be teaching just how uh, Michael Zimmerman here is. Uh, but in a very different way um, uh, over at the college level and we also have the opportunity to do it in the community which is really great um, and then the bulk of what I do is research so for me that means working in a lab uh, doing all sorts of things we call it like wet bench which basically just means that I'm like hands-on doing experiments in the lab Wow, yeah. that's a lot of work to be a grad student and the best part is, I mean, you don't really get paid for a lot of it, huh? I mean, you, I'm lucky enough to go to a program that actually, like, sponsors us really well. Um, but uh, the hours definitely are a lot greater than what sometimes people might expect. But it's also up to you. The, gr the beauty of being in grad school is, like, you determine how you do your life and when you're working all that sort of stuff. There's a little bit of a flexibility that goes into being in science that a lot of people don't necessarily think about. Wow. Yeah, I mean, lots of work, but it's cool that you get to kind of take on your own role in yeah. your research and in what you want to do. And this is kind of you formulating what your plan for the whole future is and what you want to do with it. So what inspired you to study immunology and virology and what do you want to do with it in general? Yeah, so um, first off, immunology is the study of how your immune system responds to different uh, pathogens, which are things that cause disease like bacteria or viruses. Um, and virology is the study of viruses. Uh, so for me, I kind of look at them as going really hand in hand, but there's a huge breadth of what each of those things individually is, let alone what happens when you're looking at both of them together. Um, and the reason why I was really interested in them is because I had always really been interested in science. Uh, when I was in second grade, I tried to build a time machine. Um, and like when I was in fifth grade, I was like reading astrophysics books because like I just, that's who I was and who I guess I still am. Um, and, but when I was story, sort of like getting closer to high school and sort of beginning in high school, I was really interested in doing something that would apply this sort of like ability to be inquisitive and in solving problems to how I can use that to help other people. Um, and a lot of people feel like the only ways that you can help people are through like being a doctor or a nurse or like you know being you know a police officer or a firefighter but I felt that 
there's a lot of science that goes even into all the medicines that people are taking every single day. And that was something that I thought was really interesting. If we could understand what's causing a disease um, or how to potentially create a therapeutic target or like a preventative measure, like a vaccine, that was something I was really interested in. Um, so for me, it was a great way to help people while solving problems. And I was specifically drawn to immunology and virology because I just thought they're incredibly fascinating. Like I remember being in my first immunology lecture ever um, in college and just like crying because I was I was like so happy at the fact that this was a thing and it, I knew it was something that I wanted to do um, for the rest of my life. And viruses always just they're so bizarre. Like they're so weird. One of the first things that people tend to learn about viruses is that they're not alive, but they're not not alive either. And that's just like a very odd concept to think of in general. And I feel like viruses only get weirder the more you learn about them. Um, so it's kind of, I don't know, I just think that they're, they're really cool. And they apply to so many different things in human health um, that I was very interested in that. Um, and what I want to do with that, personally, I'm interested in staying in science, in an academic setting. And when we say like in an academic setting, we just mean like staying in sort of like the university side of it, running a lab. For me, it means like being a professor and having my own research group. Wow, that's so cool. So it is, it, viruses are such an interesting concept because like you said, <laughs> they're, they are alive, they're not alive. I, I actually made that mistake myself a few days ago. Um, I was talking about just viruses with one of my friends and I was like, yeah, it's like so weird because they're like living things. And he's like, they're not living things, Michael. And I'm like, oh, right, they're not. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I had to really kind of figure that out myself, but they, they are a mystery and an, and an enigma and they change so rapidly as um, I've been learning. So really crazy. And I like what you said about being in that uh, academic setting. And, you know, as a professor, a lot of professors do uh, do extra research as well. And that's why they teach at the university is that they, they teach and they help, uh, or not they help, they, they do their own research projects and a lot of times students will go and join in on those research projects and help them. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And then on, on that note, uh, you mentioned to me earlier that some uh, important aspects of the science fields are collaboration and community, which as we saw within the, the academic uh, setting that you were describing. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that and what the um, what types of collaborations you do? Yeah, so for me, I think it's really important that we talk about sort of the community side of science because I think people are really focused on the idea of you're driving knowledge and you're discovering new things, which are really cool in itself. And that's how like a lot of us even get into it in the first place. Um, but I think a really big part of science is you have to learn so much, not just as far as knowledge goes, but even how to plan your experiments, how to think about science, like what are the questions you even should be asking. If you need information in order to like know what questions exist in the field, you have to know how to find that information. There's just a lot of things that like I still don't even know how to do well. Um, and you know, a huge part of the journey of going through science is the relationships that you have with other people. I think people tend to stay in science because they had someone who mentored them. Um, I know that I had someone at every step of my career, but especially I know the, the last uh, mentor that I had before going into graduate school, I was really close with. She was someone who really taught me a lot about how to conduct science, but also was just someone who was really there for me and supportive of me as a person. Um, because like, you're not just a scientist, you're also a person. Um, you bring yourself into every interaction you have, even if that's professional. And so those relationships that you get to build in science are incredibly important. 
Um, and that's why I want to stay in academia is because I call it like having science children, which is a really weird way to, to phrase it. But I think that thinking about the people in science as like your family is a really vital concept because you spend so much time with your lab mates and you're all working together, um, not necessarily on the exact same specific research question, but you're like in the same family of research questions. Um, and so you're working together as a team to accomplish common goals and to help each other grow. Um, and then even on top of that, a lot of times in science, different labs will collaborate with each other. Um, so this could be one group specializes in like more computational biology, which is like the programming heavy type of stuff. Um, where it's all based on like the computer and then there's you know, so you like want to model a specific thing, like how a protein looks. And so that's not your lab's expertise. Your lab's expertise is what type, what site on a virus's envelope is an antibody binding to. And so basically antibodies, I'll get into that uh, in a second in the science side of it. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there in, in a second. So like, okay, we have this specialty, you have this specialty, let's work together and see how we can bring these expertises uh, into one thing. So science is all about working together um, to achieve common goals. And I think that that's something that's really, really special. Right, nobody can know everything, right? Yeah. So you have to go to other people and you have to learn from them in order to be able to do the proper research and get the, the results that you want from that research. So. I, uh, when you were talking, I was like, I'm going to pull up this picture, uh, to share a science family. And this is Laura's science family. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is the lab that I, I work in. This is a really silly photo. Um, basically the, this is like, as part of the whole, this is when the social distancing stuff first started getting introduced. And so one member of our lab had to sit at another table. And so we decided to take like this picture where it looked like we were all judging him. And um, the, the person who's in charge of our lab, we call him a PI or a principal investigator. Um, she had said that she was going to be leaving earlier than she actually ended up leaving. So we ended up seeing her from a distance. And we were joking that she's coming down from the ceiling to check in on us or something. And so that's like the story behind this picture. But like, this is not... This is not like normal photos of a lab you'll see. Like normally everyone looks nice and they're in front of a professional background. This is just something that I threw together because I, I think it's good to have a sense of humor. But that doesn't stop the friendships that you make. So, you know, even though your lab might look professional outside, you still have friends. As a teacher, oh, yeah. I might seem professional at work, but I got, I got friends from work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, in science, like, you you have really hard times and you have really great times and your lab is there for you to support you through the struggles and like so when nothing you're doing is working they're there for you and when you finally get your data that you've been looking for you find something really exciting they're there for you for that as well like and they truly are your family yeah and sometimes things don't work for a while <laughs> And yeah. so you really need that support. You really need that help. It's sometimes just, it, you, may ne you may never get a positive result in your research. And that's not an unnatural occurrence. That's just yeah. science. And you may, yeah. you know, the, the hypothesis that you've created may not be true. And so, yeah. you know, your results may come out wrong every time. <laughs> not wrong, just not how you expected. Right. That was, that was not the correct term. Wrong would not be, there, there isn't really a wrong in science. No, there's no wrong. And that's something that like in science, you even have to get used to early on in your career that like negative data is still data. And like, you should be proud of all of the successes you have, even if those successes are failures. Right. Right. All right. So let's get more into the technical things about virology, um, and especially the research that you're doing in the hutch. So just in general, what are viruses and what symptoms correlate to them? So viruses are, if you want to use the most fancy 
high level like terminology for it, they're obligate intracellular parasites. And that's just a fancy way of saying that they are things that can't live outside of a cell. So they're, the whole obligate means that they have no other option than to, you know, rely on something else. So it's not a choice. They can't survive outside of a host. That's where parasite comes from. Viruses don't have the machinery to do the cellular functions that like our cells can. Our cells are able to like make new proteins and, you know, replicate our genomes, like if do DNA repair or something. Like there's all these processes that happen in our cells every single day. Um, and viruses are not able to do that, which is why they need to be inside of a host. Um, and that's where intracellular comes from because they are within your cells. Um, so that's also where the whole idea of are they alive or are they not alive comes from because technically like a virus that's not in a cell is completely inert, which means it can't really do anything at all. It's not alive. Um, but once it gets into a cell, that's where you would start thinking that it might be alive because it's using all of these host processes. Um, and using like the, the chemical reactions, the biological reactions that you have um, to carry out what it means. And technically um, it's like reproducing it, but through the replication of the cells, right? Yeah, so it's, it's basically when we say that a virus is like replicating, what that means is that, so it has its genome. So we have DNA that encodes everything that we are. Viruses might have DNA or they might not. They might use RNA instead. Um, and so they're like going and they're making another copy of that genome. And then it like needs to get packaged up into this like little, little thing. Um, this is called a capsid. For those of you who really want to get the big terms, it's called a capsid. That's what it is. Um, and it's basically, it's just like a protein shell. Um, that holds this this DNA or RNA that can then take it, you know, out into other cells. And it's using your body's ability to, you know, replicate um, a genome or to make proteins. Like some viruses will encode certain things, so they'll have a gene that makes it so it's easier for them to do this. Like they might have certain proteins that make these things more able to happen than others, but in no situation would they be able to do that without using your body's ability to be replicating this genome. Um, yeah, so that's, that's like what viruses are in general. Um, and, in, and viruses, that's like what makes viruses different, what do they do, um, is sort of, your vi viruses are able to infect different animals and different areas of an animal's body. So, you know, sometimes like you're a dog or a cow gets sick. Uh, sometimes, you know, we get sick. And so that's what I mean when, it says, when I say that they have different like species, different, they live in different animals. Um, but also what you might notice is sometimes if you have a viral infection, sometimes you'll have like a cough or a runny nose or something like that, while other times maybe your stomach hurts um, and you're just having a lot of like general distress um, in, in like sort of like the gut, the stomach, that area. And that all comes down to what the virus itself is infecting um, because like we just said, it's using your body's ability to do these certain things in order to power itself. So that's diverting the, those processes from you and it's so it's it's causing the damage in those areas so a virus is not the same as bacteria though right right yeah bacteria are actual single-celled organisms that are alive like if you were to take a drop of water from a pond and like put it on a slide and look under it in a microscope. You're gonna see all sorts of things, but one of the things that you might be able to see if you have like some great zoom on that microscope 
is um, like little bits of bacteria because they're able to survive on their own. Um, back, bacteria can also be beneficial. Like if you hear about people like eating yogurt when they're on antibiotics or something, um, that's because bacteria can also have like good functions. And so they, they don't necessarily have to live in you, but they can live in you. Um, but they're able to do all these processes on their own. Um, so there are two separate things. That's why like sometimes if you go to a doctor and they say that, you know, you're sick, but they don't want to give you like an antibiotic, it could be because it's a viral infection. Um, so they're not the same thing and different, tar there's different targets for each of those. And viral infections, you have to kind of let run their course, whereas... For the most part. Yeah. There's, there's some drugs that exist that target viruses, um, but they're, they're sort of fewer and far between. Um, obviously, if a virus is like more severe than another virus, there might have been more dedicated research into it um, that have more targets. But in general, viruses are a lot harder for us to target than bacteria. Right. And then generally, they, they change a lot, too. So, I mean, yeah. how does that affect how we treat a viral infection? It definitely can. Um, so if you're like looking at, there's, there's, there's a very specific public health example that like always comes to mind with this. Um, so viruses, because they're using your machinery, they don't necessarily have a lot of the things that you might have that are beneficial during a replication process. So if, if, if you can imagine copying something word for word, um, for lots and lots of time. You can imagine that at least every once in a while you'd make a mistake, you'd accidentally write the wrong letter in the word or something like that. And that's something that can happen within your own body. Um, and, but luckily your body knows that that's something that's gonna happen. And there's, you know, imagine it's like your, your friend comes up and reads what you just wrote and checks it and says, oh, is this correct? Oh, no, it's not, let me just go fix that real quick. So like your body can do that. Um, but viruses can because they're using your stuff, but they're not using all of your stuff. The same things aren't at play here. Um, so it could just copy the word wrong and no one would ever know. And so that's why it's able to like have all these differences. And so if a virus is able to be copying a lot or it has mechanisms that are more faulty than others like there's better ways to try and go about copying something down like it's you know if you think about it it's easier to copy and paste on a computer than do it by hand um, so some viruses are you know more closer to the side of copying and pasting on a computer and others are doing it by hand so to speak I guess is a way to think about it um, and so if it's just like doing it by hand um, really, really fast in a rush, um, it's going to make a lot of mistakes and those aren't going to get caught. And so different, because of those changes that are happening at the gene scale, you're going to see changes happening structurally, like those viruses would look different in some cases or behave a little bit differently, which is why some viruses are a lot harder to create therapies for than others. How does a virus get into its host? If it's not alive, is it moving itself? To, can it control where it goes? So there's a lot of different mechanisms. So viruses will use a lot of different mechanisms. Some viruses actually will take advantage of the host, like the defenses that you already have in place. So there's a specific type of immune cell that patrols your body. Again, if you're, if you're aiming for that high level terminology, they're called macrophages. Um, but if you're, if you're like just wanting to break down what even a macrophage would be, like these are the cells that would be like, they're the garbage men. They're walking around, they're looking around for anything that shouldn't be there, like trash on the ground, and they're trying to pick it up. And so there's like some viruses actually that will go in and infect those cells because those cells are the ones that go back to your lymph nodes. Um, uh, which is like the network of like, if you feel like there's like these little bumps on your neck right there, um, that might like get bigger when you're sick. Um, those are lymph nodes. They're all over your body. And that's where like a lot of your immune cells are. Um, and so they get, by 
being able to infect those like garbage men macrophage cells, they're able to get back into this network to be able to travel all over your body. Um, so there's all sorts of different mechanisms that viruses have um, to be able to, to get into a host in the first place. It all comes down to, you know, cellular receptors, which is basically like if you think about it, you know, a protein would have a different structure, right? Like if you're thinking about like a lid for a jar or something, um, some, some lids, if you have like a really small jar, you would need a small lid. Um, whereas if you're like looking at a bigger jar, you would need a bigger lid and you couldn't put the small lid on that bigger jar. And that's sort of like the same concept of like your viruses, viruses will be trying to have, like will look like different lids and your body has like those different jars that those lids could go on to. And so that kind of is what's dictating it, is, is what structures there are on a virus and what structures there are in you. <laughs> like we said, they're an enigma. It's, it's yeah. how many different things that viruses can do even though they're not technically considered alive. <laughs> so yeah. your lab, specifically works with a virus uh, type called flaviviruses. Yeah. And what makes those different from other viruses? So flaviviruses are different from like, like if you think about the flu, uh, based on, you know, what their, what their, what genes they have. Like, like I said, some viruses might have DNA and others might not. Um, so there's sort of that might be something that would set a flavivirus apart. Um, but if you want to think about it, sort of what that would look like on a larger scale, it's it kind of comes down to the diseases. So flaviviruses cause a lot of um, like fevers or might, you know, target the, the brain. Um, so if you think about like Dengue or West Nile virus or Zika is kind of the most recently known example that came to light where uh, within the last couple of years um, there was like this whole issue where a lot of babies were being born with like really small heads um, and it was because their mothers or fathers had gotten infected with Zika um, and so Zika as a flavor virus is able to then cause infections and issues in the brain, which is what caused that result. And so um, the mother passed on that virus to the child? Is that what happened? Essentially, yeah. Because, because remember, like the child is going to be developing inside of the mother. And so, so there's a lot of things that get transferred between the mother and the child. And so um, that's one way that it could get through, yeah. Wow. And so you mentioned the the three viruses already. Are those the most common bloody viruses that you study in your lab? Yeah, those are that's what my lab focuses on for sure. Those three are the are so, the ones. So it was dengue, Zika, Zika and then West Nile. West Nile virus. Okay. Yeah, and these are all viruses that are spread by like mosquitoes. Um yeah, it's like a, a whole lot of viruses are spread by mosquitoes and ticks. The nasty um, mosquitoes, I'm telling you. And if you, want, if you want to learn more about that, the high-level term that you can use is arboviruses, um, which basically, again, just means that they're being spread by ticks or mosquitoes. By the time we are back from distance learning or at, even just after you watch this video, you're all going to be like, arboviruses. And... <laughs> Flavy viruses, and I know all these terms now because Laura Belmont told me them on YouTube. <laughs> so <laughs> you're all gonna be smarty pants. Um, okay, so you research these three flavy viruses. What is the goal? Can you describe that of your research? Yeah, so our lab in general looks at the roles of the immune system in how viral infection can both get better or even get worse. And so the, the main way that this is mediated, which is something I mentioned earlier, is through antibodies. And essentially, antibodies are just something that 
are created by a specific immune cell that then go out and are trying to kind of destroy the target, right? Like they're, they're specific to what's invading your body. Um, and the whole point is that they're going to then go in, they're going to bind to it. So they're going to be like physically holding on to this, in this case, it's a virus, um, with the goal of like, you know, trying to kill it, trying to prevent it from getting into more of your cells, um, stuff like that. But what's really interesting about a flavivirus like Dengue um, is that there's actually a group of these antibodies that instead of making you better can actually make you worse um, because they're not able to prevent that viral binding. Um, instead, they actually are able to make it so it's easier for the virus to get into your host cell. Um, and that's, so that's specifically what my project looks at in the lab. Um, there are other people in our lab who are studying um, kind of those antibodies that are actually doing their job right. Um, you know, how can we, how can we make that more relevant to helping people? How can we better understand what's going on there? So I'm on the side of, okay, there's this, this thing where antibodies are going wrong with dengue. How can we prevent that from happening and understand it so we can make it so it's easier for people to get treated or even get a vaccine being able to be prevented from getting it in the first place. I always thought of antibodies as like the warriors of the body and they're going in and they're fighting that war so that we can survive. Uh, but in this case, they are not, they're not, I would say the bad guys of this, but they just, they, they just don't know how to fight. They're just those people that need the training, I guess, right? Yeah, um, it's, yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. They're, they're not necessarily bad. They're just, they're just drawn that way. Uh, to quote a, a Disney movie from a while ago. Um. <laughs> Who framed Roger Rabbit? I know it. Don't test the Disney nerd. I know you I'm know it. I don't know. I don't know if, um, if your students way. are as into it as you are. Well, those of you at home who have Disney Plus, go watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It's a really good movie. Just random tangent. <laughs> <laughs> But okay, so you're trying to technically help them to to better fight against this virus? In a way, yes. We're not necessarily trying to change the antibodies themselves, at least at this step. That's not what we're trying to do. We're just trying to understand like what is it in your body that's making it so you're more likely to see these antibodies that are making it easier for infection to happen. We're not necessarily trying to change the antibodies in what I do, at least now, we're just trying to figure out what's going on in your body that's making it so these, these antibodies are acting this way. Mm. Do you have a like hypothesis as to why? Um, so there's certain genes that we think might be responsible for this. Um, that the, the issue is that, you know, they're involved in so many different functions in your cellular processes, and this isn't something that's super well understood. So there's a whole bunch of different things that could be going wrong, but we think that there's a few specific genes that might be making this happen. Um, and I'm just, it's my job to try to figure out which ones and, you know, we have a list of some genes that we think might be involved, um, but I have to go through and see if they actually are. Mm. They actually so, are. I mean, with all these different genes that could be involved, I mean, you must have a few processes that you have to go through in order to get information, huh? Yeah. So the, the list of genes in the first place was made through like the idea of something that we call a screen, which is where you're just sort of looking broadly. It's like, it's like the idea of casting a net out into the ocean and seeing what fish you bring back. Like literally in science, we, we call these sorts of things 
fishing expedition. That's literally how we would refer to it because it's the idea that like you're not necessarily starting with like a hypothesis of like I think it's this gene, so I'm going to go through the steps figuring out. Like the first thing you do is you literally just cast your net out and see if you get anything back. Um, that's what it's that's what it is essentially. Um, so we threw our net out to get these different genes um, where you're like, when what's really great is we're at a point in science where we're able to really easily turn genes on or off um, and make it so they are or are not expressed in your cells. And so by getting rid of these genes in your cells, we're able to see, okay, is that making it so there's more viral infection or less viral infection? Um, in the presence of these different antibodies. Um, and so from there, it's like, okay, now we have this list of genes that it looks like when they were gone, infection was not there because with those genes, you're getting more infection. So when they're gone, you would be getting less infection. And so now it's up to me to, now we have, okay, so we have these cells that don't have those genes. First, you have to make sure that you actually don't have those genes because like we said earlier, sometimes things in science don't work. So you always have to make sure that what you did is actually what you think you did. Um, and then from there, we're able to actually go in and do infections with these cells where we're taking these cells that are missing those genes and infecting them with the virus um, that has been exposed to the antibody. And looking at the infection levels, and if we if we end up being able to find that the, the gene does have an impact, then we can try to add the gene back in and see if we're able to restore that that function that we saw in the first place. Um, because in science, a lot of people think that paper, scientific literature is really really complicated, and it is. Like we don't even understand it sometimes. Um, but one of the things that you have to know is that if you think of, that scientists are just like, okay, so there's like this article and it just says the same thing over again, but in like five different ways. That's exactly what's going on because science is all about just like testing the, the thing over and over again to seeing if it really holds true. Um, so from there, if we, if we think that we have a gene that actually looks like it's causing the effect we think it has, then we have to do like all these different ways. Of, of seeing if it actually has that effect. Um, so, I don't know if that answers the question. No, it does, yeah. I mean, it sounds like it's, I mean, one, a lot of work, but two, you have to repeat quite a lot yes. in order to even try to get results. And I know from experience, I, I worked in the chemistry lab for a little bit and I would constantly have to make the same chemicals over and over and over again. And it would get really tiring because I'd just go in and just be like, I'm going to mix all these things again. Cool. Uh, and then, you know, you see what types of results you can get. And sometimes you just need to change it just a little bit, just like one milliliter less of this chemical. And yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, maybe that will change the results. Um, what challenges occurred in your research and how do you at least try to overcome them? Yeah, so I think, you know, every research project is going to have its own inherent thing. Um, you know, and the challenges can be very different in what they look like. So for instance, you know, we're, uh, we're fortunate enough that like nowadays we're able to grow cells in a dish. Like cell culture is the baseline of all the work that I do. Um, and, you know, for one of the genes in particular, when we knock it out, we see that our cells don't grow very well. Um, and so it's really hard to get the cells that you need in order to do an experiment because the cells just are growing so badly because they're missing a gene that they need. Um, and like, we just went about that by waiting. Um, waiting and, you know, changing how much, how much cells you're putting in your dish in the first place uh, can be something. It's just like, it's just like a bunch of little things that can add up. Um, you're also going to see things where maybe you order a reagent from a company. A reagent is just like the chemicals or, um, you know, little things that you would need to do your experiment. So if you're ordering, you know, something that will tell you if you have a protein or not, 
um, you've got to make sure that it actually checks for the protein you want. And sometimes these, these reagents that you're getting don't work. They don't do what they say they have to. And so you just have to keep searching and testing them over and over again until you finally find one that actually works. And that is so much harder than you would think. Um, you would think that it would be easy, but it's not. Um, and so like that's another big issue that we had. Um, and even another issue that came up is we knew that not everything that our, our initial screen would that it had it given us, like we knew that not all of it was going to actually work how it was expected when we went in and tested it in our cells again. Um, and sure enough, there were a couple instances where our, our hits didn't come back to actually work how we thought they would, um, which is just, you know, going through and seeing if there any, is anything in our screen that, that did work. And if it doesn't end up working, then, you know, trying again with the screen using a slightly different approach to our screen. Um, to see if we can get that outcome. Oh, wow. How can the research that you do in your lab affect the outside world, the world away from your lab? So you're finding all this information, going through all these challenges, and then how does that eventually help towards the future of maybe healthcare in general? Yeah, so with the viruses that we study, um, so dengue affects I think it's 390 million people worldwide. Yes, it's 390 million infections per year. And that's about the population of the entire United States. That's about what that is. So like imagine everyone in the United States got sick with this, this same virus. Um, you wouldn't want that to be a thing. Like you would want people to not have to feel sick. You wouldn't want them to be having all these fevers. Um, and so what's great is anything that we learn in the lab um, can be applied to potential like therapeutic options. Um, and especially in the project that I'm doing, it's really helpful for vaccine development because the big issue with vaccinating people against dengue is this whole process that I talked about where antibodies are kind of not doing their jobs really well. That happens when you're exposed to different types of dengue. Um, and so if you were to give someone a vaccine against one type of dengue, but they got infected with a second type of dengue, it could actually make it so you're getting more infection. Um, and you would never want to do that. And that's a huge problem in vaccine development. So the whole goal that we have here is better prevention and better treatment of these patients. And like I said earlier with Zika, that was a virus that caused a lot of issues um, with developing babies. Um, and if we're able to target it, those viruses, then we don't have to worry about those babies having such severe health impacts. Hmm. That fear of like the dengue spreading uh, and potentially even being as as uh, populated as the United States, that kind of reminds me a little bit of today's situation and the fear of the coronavirus and, you know, our our current shelter in place situation of of um, you know we're afraid that we're going to continue to pass that virus on. So, is there anything you can share with us about today's situation with the coronavirus that may be helpful or maybe more informative than potentially what we might hear in the media or news? Yeah. Um, so, I would say in general, when you're thinking about the media and the news, they're trying to build a story. And in science, you're also trying to build a story, but they mean two very different things. Um, and so when we say we're trying to build a story in science, we mean we're trying to explain what, what, what is even happening here. Um, and so just kind of keep in mind that, you know, looking at different sources than maybe the media and the news is probably smart, like the World Health Organization is a great place to look for information. The Center for Disease Control is a great place to look for information. Um, I'm also going to plug something that I think is really cool. My friends and I think it's really cool and we just go on it every now and then um, just to check it out. Um, there's someone at the Hutch actually who- Hutch. The Hutch. Um, there's someone actually at the Hutch who does this thing where he tracks viruses 
in real time. And let me just pull that up. I was about to pull it up, but you can pull it up because you know how oh, to control it Oh, if you want better. to pull it up, go for it. You know, I think you know how to control it better than me. We tried it a little bit earlier before we got on video, and it was, uh, it was a time for me. I was like, oh my gosh, look at this coronavirus spread, and then realized I was actually looking at the dengue virus. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Laura, um, you can do it. <laughs> there we go. Um... Okay, or, or it's not going to collaborate how I want it to. You know what? We're just going to put it back here and we're going to just show it this way. So, something that's really cool at, that's going on at the Hutch is there's actually like real time tracking of the spread of the virus. Um, and this is just more like for curiosity than anything. So, what you can see is like when a circle pops up, that means that it's a case of an infection. And the lines that come out from it show how it spreads. Um, and so you're able to like see over time how it's spreading globally. Um, and so that's just something to think about as far as, you know, if you're someone who's like, oh, this seems to be spreading a lot, but I don't really understand like how it's spreading. This is a really great way to sort of visualize what's happening. And it, it shows you throughout the different weeks. Um, it, it, breaks it down, um, and then once this finishes, so yeah, you can see that there's all these different um, things around, and now this is kind of the map fully developed where it is now everything that's happened. And if you look up here, you get this really, really complicated tree, um, which is, this is just, I'm just showing this because um, some people are really into evolution and trees, and I'm not, um, but people that are really into that. And so in case you're really into these trees, I just want you to know that this exists. Um, if you look up nextstrain.org, this is all this stuff. And you can also look at other viruses that are, are happening through time, like Michael the Ruman said earlier, where he's like looked at it with like dengue before the call. Um, so all sorts of viruses are being tracked. So um, just remember like it's not the only virus that's currently going around the population. And that doesn't, just because it, is getting more attention doesn't necessarily mean that it's like the only thing that matters and is out there. Um, and there's all these other viruses doing things all the time. It's just some of them might be getting more attention from the news and media than others, whereas scientists are giving all these different viruses all their attention. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. I guess something else that I would say is that, you know, when we're thinking about all of this, a lot of people might be worried or not worried. Everyone's sort of in all these different places about what's going on. But just remember that, you know, when you're younger, you have a lot better of an immune system. And so the whole idea of like you guys are in a shelter in place situation is not necessarily to protect you guys, it's to protect the people that might be around you. Some people, might just have weaker immune systems because of, you know, a, a certain illness or medical condition or, or um, just also as you get older at a certain point, your immune system starts getting weaker. Um, and it's, it's really all about protecting those people. But I think that people are acting like all of these things are, are brand new ideas that you should be washing your hands you know, for the full 20 seconds, you should be limiting how much stuff you're touching and then touching yourself, like, or like your food. Um, you should be more careful about like who you're interacting with. You know, if you're someone who has a weak immune system, like these are things you're thinking about all the time. And I think that it's really important to realize that like, these are things that we should all always be thinking about and not just now because it sounds scary. These are things that are like normal precautions that people are taking every single day. Um, obviously, these, uh, these are getting a little bit more extreme just because some viruses are better at spreading around than others. But, you know, you should always be washing your hands like this. You should always be um, careful about touching yourself or your food after you're touching all these other things. Um, in general, like, if you feel like you might be sick, you shouldn't be hanging out with people that have weaker immune systems. Like, these are things that are really normal precautions to be thinking about as you go through everyday life. Um, 
and that's something that science says all the time and media doesn't necessarily say all the time. So just think about where the information is coming from. Think about, you know, obviously you should be, you know, concerned in a sense that you should be aware of what's going on and aware of what you're doing, but you shouldn't necessarily like be freaking out about what's going on either. It feels really, really weird because this is the first time that I think a lot of people have really thought about public health and the spread of viruses. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not something that we've been through before and um, it's not necessarily a set of brand new precautions that no one's ever heard of before. These are things that people are doing every day already. Right. And, you know, again, we are doing this, we are staying at home or staying indoors because we want to stop spreading the virus and like we saw earlier viruses change rapidly and, and spread pretty fast so in the um the big graph that you showed with all the dots the, all of those dots were new subspecies of the virus right yeah so they're essentially let me make that bigger yeah so all of these represent an individual like virus that a patient would have um because like i said earlier as viruses are trying to copy themselves. Um, they might be going faster uh, or not be doing something that's as efficient that makes it so there's a lot of different changes that are happening. And so as it goes from person to person, that's where those, those sort of changes happen. The changes can also happen within an individual patient. Um, but each of these points does represent a different patient's virus. Um, and if you scroll over it, it says like this one doesn't have an amino acid mutation um, or so you can kind of see how related they are to each other based on the amount of mutations that they have between them. And these mutations are just the changes that happen um, in the virus's gene. Mm. So this is called a phylogeny, and that pretty much is just saying how has something evolved. So in evolutionary biology, they do phylogenies for pretty much everything so that we can see how something came to be the way it is today. In this case, we're looking at the phylogeny of the actual virus and how it changes and it, i mean you can look at at the beginning we're looking at december 17 2019 and at the very end we're looking at a little past march 11th 2020 and so that's not, uh, that's a very short amount of time for something to change yeah hmm. um and there's kind of like two concepts that come to mind when i think about that and the first one is the idea that um you know, a lot of people, we look different in the sense of like, you know, Mr. Zimmerman's hair is curly and mine isn't. Um, like, we have different eye colors, there's stuff like that. But overall, like, we're pretty similar if you were to look at our genes. And that's because humans overall only have kids. I think they define a generation as like every 16 years or something. But in general, like, reproduction and human life cycle takes a really long time. Whereas viruses are just kind of like going in and out of a host most of the time. Um, some viruses will stay in a host and those are, that's like a whole different viral strategy. Um, but for a lot of these cases, they're just trying to get in and out as fast as they can. This replication is happening at really fast levels, which is why you're able to see this, this evolution happen so quickly. Um, is because they don't have to go through this whole process of like, okay, baby's gonna be inside of someone else for like nine months, and then they're gonna develop over the course of the next 18 to 25 years after that, and then only then might there be another cycle. Like viruses, are, they're just going. Um, and so that's something to think about, like, you know, this looks really, really fast and really, really scary, um, but it's a lot of it just comes down to the nature of like what viruses are and what they do versus how that would compare to something like a, a human. And so to tie it all together and going back to your research a little bit, do you think that the research that you do in your lab could potentially apply to our current situation with this virus? So I think that there's some things to keep in mind with this, which is that viruses are different. A lot of people have been saying that, oh, this coronavirus is a type of flu, um, which is not true. There are actually two separate viral families, um, which 
like I said earlier, flaky virus is a viral family. Um, just means that they have different ways that they infect and what those effects look like. Um, and so something that we might find out about flavy viruses might not actually end up applying to coronaviruses. However, sometimes there are things that you can find out that are, are common between them. Um, so if there's, you know, a case where we find out that this coronavirus is being made worse by that the antibody is not doing their job as well. If we're able to find out something about this process of antibodies not doing their job right, then maybe we could manipulate that when trying to help people who are facing this infection, which has sort of the same end result. Um, if we're able to find out some general therapeutic measure against that works against not just flavor viruses, but viruses in general, that could apply. Um, so sometimes things in, in virology can be interplayed like that and can have um, those wider functions and sometimes uh, the biology is just different enough that it doesn't have carryover. Um, and it's also kind of like just if, you, if you're finding, wow, I have a lot of time on my hands and I want to really like look into some weird cool science concepts, there's this whole side of science that's trying to do drug repurposing, which is like the idea of a medicine was designed to do some specific thing, like it's designed to help blood pressure. Um, and so it's been through clinical trials, you know it's safe, and you're trying to figure out like, how can we affect like the blood supply of cancer? This blood pressure drug that we find it looks like it's already safe, which would make it easier to get out to patients, let's see if it has an effect. And sometimes these drugs that seem like they wouldn't relate to each other at all um, end up being able to have some carryover and have some effect. Um, so you never know where science could end up connecting, um, but it's not 100% a guarantee. Wow. I mean, no matter what the outcome is, it seems like the future is in good hands with you and your colleagues and, you know, all the research and virology that you do. So thank you so much for, for all that you do. And thank you for taking your time out to interview with me and uh, help teach my students a little bit more about the world of science. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Like, something that's really important to a lot of us in science is the ability to, like, do things like outreach like this um, and just to put the seeds in the head now um, you know as students like you guys should be aware that there's actually a lot of opportunities as you get older to engage in science before you even get to college um, there's a lot of like outreach that places just like the hut should do um, to try to bring in you know high school students to learn about science and, and maybe do some research um, there's even a program for like seventh and eighth graders that is done um, in in the Seattle area that I had I had the option to potentially TA with. So there's a lot of options out there uh, that you can even think about. Like if you know that science is something you're interested in, I started doing research when I was in high school. Um, so it's definitely like an option that exists. I I wish that I had known about it earlier. And so you know the outreach that you're doing is really important because it impacts you know all, all the students that you have. And the people that they might interact with, you know, maybe a student is like here and they're like, yeah, science is cool, but it's not necessarily for me. Their best friend could love science and love an opportunity like that. Um, so you never know where outreach ends up going. That, that's so true. So, and even, even today, I mean, our students after this could go on to nextstrain.org and look into viruses. I mean, there's so much that we can look at on the internet in general as well. So, yeah. I mean, you can always keep your minds open to, to learning new things and to learning about viruses or immunology. So again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are going to end our interview now. And so for uh, those of you at home, stick around for more interviews and I will see you all a little later. Peace.